So in this video, I will now go over all the different classes of protein synthesis inhibitors without focusing too much on the mechanism of action because there's a separate video just to point out some high yield tested stuff and some clinically re relevant information for each of these drug classes. So we're going to start with the aminoglycosides. Re Important representatives are gentamicin, topramycin, amikacin, and streptomycin. Please note they all end in mycin. However, there are more antibiotics that end in mycin and are not aminoglycosides. So, so one important characteristic of the aminoglycosides is that they are bactericidal. So if you think generally about protein synthesis inhibitors, you would predict that they are rather bacteriostatic because they inhibit their growth, because protein synthesis is important for, for the replication of the cell. But the aminoglycosides are one important exception where those drugs act bactericidal. And so they have some additional mechanism of action that also might in part explain the bactericidal effect. So first of all, they like to bind to LPS because aminoglycosides are positively charged and LPS is negatively charged. So they like to bind to LPS. And if you remember that, then you can also predict in which kind of bacteria those are gonna act, namely in gram-negative bacteria because only gram-negative bacteria have LPS. So by binding, they already do some membrane damage and that might in part explain the bactericidal effect. Another important point to remember is that they are taken up into the cell and remember the ribosome are inside the cell, so we need to get somehow inside the cell in an oxygen-dependent process. And that's also an important fact because that might help you to remember that they do not work against anaerobia because obviously they're not going to have an oxygen-dependent uptake. Important side effects are the nephrotoxicity and the ototoxicity. They are also contraindicated in pregnancy. And now you're also going to understand why their coverage is only against gram-negatives, gram-negative anaerobes. A lot of times the aminoglycosides are given together with cell wall synthesis inhibitor. And the reason behind this is that people have found when you combine those two drug classes, you have a synergistic effect. And this can be predicted because if you already destroy the cell wall, so the aminoglycosides might have an easier way to get into the cell, to get to the target, to the ribosomes. So aminoglycosides are often combined with cell wall synthesis inhibitors also to get gram-positive coverage because as a monotherapy, the aminoglycosides only act against gram-negatives. The next class of drugs are the oxazolidinons, and there's the linezolid and some newer ones like the tetaisolid. And those are, as predicted, bacteriostatic. Some adverse effects to remember are GI distress, which you're going to see in most of the antibiotics, bone marrow suppression and neuropathy. So bone marrow suppression and neuropathy are predictable because those are related to mitochondrial toxicity. So why is mitochondrial toxicity predictable? Well, ribosomes are very different between mammalian and bacterial cells, except in the mitochondria. Mitochondrial ribosomes and bacterial ribosomes are in fact very similar. So it's thought that some of the protein synthesis inhibitors also might inhibit mitochondrial protein synthesis. And so mitochondria are the key organelles for energy production in mammalian cells. And so optic nerve, retina, brain, skeletal muscle, and kidney tissues are highly dependent on oxidative metabolism. And therefore, you can expect some side effects like bone marrow suppression and neuropathy. Furthermore, it's important to remember that the oxazolidinones are MAO inhibitors, so you always need to watch out for drug-drug interaction with other drugs like SSRIs or MAOIs and should be worried about serotonin syndrome. So the oxazolidinone only affect gram-positive bacteria. And the reason is that gram-negative bacteria have an efflux pump where the oxazolidinone are substrates for. So they get into gram-negative bacteria, but are just going to be pumped right back out. 
So they are intrinsically resistant, the gram-negatives. Because the oxazolidinones are a kind of newer class of drugs, we are using them only for this drug-resistant bacteria like MRSA, VRE, and VRSA. So the next class of drug that I want to discuss are the tetracyclines. And those share the common ending cycling. So in terms of side effects, besides GI distress, you should be worried about tooth discoloration and also irregularities in bone growth. And the reason is that tetracyclines are very good chelators, so they love to bind to divalent cations. So they love to bind to calcium. So where is the most calcium in our body? in the bone and in the teeth, and that's where we see the side effects. So that explains this tooth discoloration and also irregularities in bone growth. Further, they increase the sensitivity of the skin to sunlight, so they are phototoxic, and you should always tell your patient to wear sunscreen. They're contraindicated in pregnancy in children, and that's mainly because of the irregularities in bone growth. So what is the spectrum of activity of tetracyclines? Generally, they're very broad spectrum. What are their specific uses? So definitively against acne, in, you're gonna see them in a lot of acne ointments and against a lot of this odd bacteria. What do I mean with odd bacteria? Any atypical bacteria that are not typically show up on a gram stain, like rickettsia, chlamydia, mycoplasma, spirochets. So all these listed bacteria here do not have a typical cell wall. And it also makes sense to think about the tetracyclines to treat those bacteria because our number one antibiotics, the cell wall synthesis inhibitors, are out for these bacteria because, let's say, mycoplasma does not even have a cell wall and all these others have a very thin cell wall or live inside a cell and therefore have a little bit different shape of cell wall. So let's finish this slide with the drug chloramphenicol. So I don't want to spend a lot of time because it's rarely used because of some serious adverse effects. And the problem of chloramphenicol is that it can lead to aplastic anemia. So it kind of dissolves your bone marrow. And this is an idiosyncratic reaction. You cannot predict it. It is not dose dependent. It's usually fatal. So you don't want to use this drug only as a last, last, last resort. It is super broad spectrum and it basically covers everything. So you can remember that with pouring chlorine on an organism because it really covers everything. So the next class of drugs that I want to discuss are the macrolides. And the macrolides end all with thromycin. So erythromycin, acythromycin, clarithromycin, and telithromycin. The only specific side effect that I would remember is QT prolongation, so always be careful in patients with a history of arrhythmias. And then you should also know that there are SIP inhibitors with the exception of acythromycin, which is not one. So if you have a patient with more drugs, you should use always acythromycin to avoid any SIP interactions. So the coverage is in general broad. And and you can remember some first-line bacteria that you use it with lag mac So lag is for Legionella, and Legionella and macrolides are really like ham and cheese on a sandwich. They really fit together. This is a first-line drug for Legionella. And then the MAC, first of all, stands for macrolides, to remind you about that. And then the M stands for Mycobacterium avium, which is a very specific pneumonia that mainly immunocompromised patients particularly HIV patients are going to get. Then the A stands for atypicals, referring to anything that can cause atypical pneumonia, including mycoplasma, chlamydia, and again Legionella, so which is kind of covered here twice. And then the C stands for Campylobacter. So Campylobacter is the number one bacteria that causes enteritis. And Campylobacter can be best covered with the macrolides. The next drug of class that I want to discuss is clindamycin, which is a so-called lincosamide antibiotic. So the group is lincosamide, but there's only one representative. So that's why I have it here. There is no specific GI distress hypersensitivity reactions. In terms of the coverage, you have to know they are only against gram positives. Why they don't cover gram negatives might have to do with different ribosomal structures, but they are one of our first line drugs for anaerobes. So you probably know that the anaerobes, you divide up in terms of where in the body you're gonna find them. So if you find them above the diaphragm, your choice of drug is clindamycin. 
If you find them below the diaphragm, like in the GI tract, your drug of choice is metronidazole. So it's one of our first line drugs against anaerobes. But please make sure that you know that it does not pass a blood brain barrier. So if you have any meningitis and with anaerobes involved, you cannot use clindamycin. So the last protein synthesis inhibitor class are the streptogramins, and we have two representatives, that's quinopristin and dalfopristin. And it turns out we are always going to give them together, and together they have also a synergistic effect, and together they are even bactericidal. So this is a second example of a protein synthesis inhibitor class that acts bactericidal in contrast to bacteriostatic, which most of the other protein synthesis inhibitors do. The only special side effects are arthralgia and myalgias. Those drugs are also CYP inhibitors, and they also only cover gram-positive because they are fairly bulky molecules, so they're never going to make it through the porin channel in the gram-negative bacteria. And because these are also one of the newer agents, we reserve them for the multiple drug-resistant strains like MRSA, VRE, and VRSA. So the last important point I want to make is between those three classes of drugs, we have cross-resistance. What does it mean? So if you think about our previous slide where we put in all the different drugs where they inhibit protein synthesis, you're going to remember that those act very similarly. And in fact, they really bind to a very similar site on the ribosome. If a bacteria wants to become resistant against an antibiotics, it can, for example, change the target of the antibiotic slightly. And it turns out the bacterium that became resistant against the macrolides and changed its target slightly is also going to be most likely resistant against clindamycin and streptogramins because the binding site is so close together. Therefore, whenever you have a bacterium that became resistant against, for example, macrolides, you cannot use clindamycin or streptogramins. So there is cross-resistance between these three groups of drugs. This concludes the video on the protein synthesis inhibitors, part two.